The original Bakugan card game was a remarkably elegant little piece of game design. Along with a set of three Bakugan marbles of your choice, your deck was built using these red-backed cards that had different colors on the front, and you take one card from each color to make your deck. By doing this, you wind up with a deck of six cards, perfectly balanced between three metal gate cards and three paper ability cards. Players each set one of their gate cards with the short edges touching, placing your card closer to your opponent, and then take turns rolling their Bakugan in an attempt to make them spring out or stand on these gate cards. When each player stands a Bakugan on a single gate card, it unfolds into the battlefield that they fight on. Each Bakugan gets a bonus to their G-Power based on their color, or attribute, and each are subject to any effect the gate card says. The highest G power wins, and the winning player claims the gate card. First to win three gate cards wins the game. The paper ability cards let you interfere with the game, giving your Bakugan boosts, rearranging gate cards, or changing the rules in play. It was perfect! You built your own little win engine and pitted it against the win engines of your opponents, and the only real randomness came from how good you were at rolling the marbles. Still, this was a toy product, so in order to keep their sales up, every new season, Spin Master would, uh tweak the rules a little bit. Now, since this was a toy line, what they did was make more toys. Traps, battle gear, mobile assault, special evolution. Baku Nano, Mechtagon, battle suits. It got a little out of hand, which is why it's kind of nice that they've gone back to basics with the Battle Planet reboot. Back down to just three Bakugan with no additional components, the new Bakugan card game trades in the gate cards for little hexagons called Baku Cores, and trades in the carefully crafted hand of just six cards for a full deck of 40, with up to three copies of any one card inside. The cards that go into your deck come from one of five attributes, Pyrus, Chaos, Darkus, Ventus, and Aquos. No, I haven't forgotten about Auralus. Trust me, it's coming. However, the cards that you can put into that deck are limited to the attributes found on your team of three Bakugan. This actually makes for an interesting deck building environment where mixing attributes is not only possible, but encouraged. Each attribute is good at certain things and at times are flat out better at some things than others. Pyrus is best at increasing damage, Chaos is better at increasing B power, etc. It's up to the player to weigh and balance these options as they build their deck, as they only get to use three of the five attributes, meaning they have to sacrifice the advantages given by the other two. It's like Redekai only done right! Wow, there's a sentence I never thought I'd say. Redekai was a card game also by Spin Master released at the tail end of the original Bakugan's life cycle, where cards came in three different colors. And some cards of certain colors would just flat out be better than similar cards from other colors. Thing was, there were no restrictions on the use of these colors, so when a card gives you a number advantage, you just use it. The new Bakugan feels like if, during deck building, you could only pick two of these three colors. Weighing the pros and cons of each attribute matters a whole lot more when building your deck in that case. I mean, sure, there are cards that have an absolute number advantage over others, but there's still a chance that you'll wind up using the weaker card because the stronger one isn't in your attribute wheelhouse. And then we have Auralis, the sixth attribute. These Bakugan are gold in color and have been brought in after Subterra was essentially folded into Ventus in order to keep Bakugan at six attributes. But here's the thing about Auralis, they have no ability cards. Outside of their character cards and the upgrades to those cards called Evos, Auralis doesn't get any of the action cards that the other attributes get. Instead, they have much higher base stats and stronger abilities. Basically, Auralis is taking one of your three attribute choices and training it in for a beat stick. There are also no cards that specifically target Auralis, particularly the cards that stop damage, making them very difficult for your opponent to deal with. It's a neat concept and really wouldn't work in any game but Bakugan. But I've gotten a little ahead of myself, haven't I? What exactly are the different card types in this game? You of course have your basic Bakugan cards that you start the game with three of, all of which must be different, each of which is tied to your Bakugan toys. These cards also have a diagram on the top right referencing which Baku cores they bring into the game. You get six of these and they must match the icons on your three basic Bakugan, but Baku cores do come in a variety and you can switch them around as long as the icons still match. These cores are set up at the start of the game on the Hide Matrix, a field created by players taking turns setting cores with at least one edge touching another core until all 12 are out on the field, just like in the quick play game. The rest of the cards go into a 40 card deck from which each player draws a starting hand of five cards. These cards are played using a resource called Energy. 
Once per turn, after you draw a card from your deck, you may take a card from your hand and place it face down in the energy zone next to your Bakugan. You have an amount of energy to spend each turn equal to the number of cards you have in this zone, and you turn these cards sideways to indicate when that energy is being used to play a card. Since we already talked about basic Bakugan, let's start with Evo cards. Evo cards are upgrades to your Bakugan that make them more powerful. After paying their energy cost, Evo cards get placed on top of the basic Bakugan that they are upgrading, replacing all of their stats and abilities with all new ones. And yes, you can play another Evo card onto an Evo Bakugan if you so choose, such as Dragonoid into Hyper Dragonoid into Titan Dragonoid. The only limitations are that they must evolve from a basic Bakugan that they share a name and attribute with, the new evolution must have a higher energy cost, and Ultra Bakugan, such as Hydra's Ultra, are considered to have a different name from their non-Ultra counterparts, so no mixing and matching. The exception to this is Diamond Bakugan. Diamond Bakugan suck. Diamond Bakugan can only be played on a basic Bakugan and cannot evolve into anything else. Even seemingly good ones like Diamond Trucks are severely hamstrung by these limitations. Thank goodness that doesn't limit the actual toys. As far as I know, the Diamond toys are just cosmetic. So what do these Bakugan do exactly? Well, turns in Bakugan are taken simultaneously. At the start of the turn, both players turn their energy cards vertical to show they can be used again, draw one card from the top of their deck, and put a card into the energy row if they so choose. Once that happens, both players choose one of their closed Bakugan and roll it into the hide matrix from about two card lengths away. Both players re-roll if they both miss, and if both Bakugan grab a core and pop open, then a battle begins. Players compare the B power rating printed on the corresponding Bakugan card, modified by any numbers found on the core they picked up, and any Bakugan special abilities, and the highest B power wins. <laughs> In case of a tie, both players drop the top card of their deck into their discard pile, and whichever card has the higher energy cost is the winner. The winning Bakugan gets to keep its core and return its card still open. The other Bakugan gets closed up or retracted, and its owner returns the core to the core matrix. If only one Bakugan grabbed a core when they were rolled, then you just skip to this victory step. The winning Bakugan then deals the number next to the fist icon on the right side of the card as damage to the opposing player, along with any buffs from the Baku core or Bakugan special abilities. If you win a battle and your other two Bakugan are already open, then the attack becomes a team attack. Add the damage ratings of your other two Bakugan to the total damage dealt before reclosing all of your Bakugan and returning their cores to the hide matrix. And where does this damage go? To the deck, of course! When a player is dealt damage, they mill that many cards from the top of their deck. For those who don't know, milling is a turn used by card game players to refer to the act of moving a card from the top of the deck straight into the discard pile. The first player to reduce their opponent's deck to zero through damage is the winner. Wait, this game uses life decking? But the, isn't that like one of the seven deadly sins of trading card game design? Do I really have to compare this game to the Harry Potter trading card game now? Yeah, I am not a big fan of life decking. And I don't mean games like Duel Masters where a handful of cards from your deck are used to represent your life total. I mean where your deck is your life total. The way I see it, your deck should be a carefully constructed and laser focused engine of victory. And the act of messing with that engine should be a bit of a difficult tactic rather than a baseline of operation. Mill decks are the most frustrating kind of deck to play against. And when your game uses life decking, every deck is a mill deck. But like lots of other games that use cards for damage, Bakugan does use a trigger system. That is, cards that have special effects when they are discarded by damage in the form of flip cards. These horizontal cards only activate their effects when they are milled into the discard pile and can be activated by paying their energy cost. Most of these cards have the effect stop, which ends the damage being dealt to your deck. For example, if my opponent's Pyrus Dragonoid hits me for 10 damage, but the first card that gets milled is the flip card Pact of Darkness, I can pay the energy cost, or in this case the alternative cost, and the damage stops there. The problem is, I think Spin Master missed the memo on how a trigger card is supposed to work. A trigger card system is a comeback mechanic meant to add an aspect of luck to a game, something that can catch a winning player off guard, but also something that a losing player cannot rely on. They're unpredictable by design. 
Trigger cards in other games usually let you play that trigger card effect for free, but in the case of flip cards, not only are most not free, some can cost as much as five. Even those whose effects equally benefit the opponent? What the heck? What were they thinking? There are some flip cards that target specific attributes at a lower cost or even for free, but are basically unusable due to how super specific their targeting is. They seem almost tailor-made to go into a sideboard, a little stash of cards that players may freely exchange with cards from their deck in between the rounds of a typical best of three game. However, Bakugan has announced no intention of adding a sideboard, essentially dooming these cards to obscurity. I mean, I see a place for some of the free flip cards, like the ones that target high damage attributes like Darkus and Pyrus, and the flip cards with alternative costs like Pact of Darkness, but a lot of them feel like a waste, and they're useless if you draw them, making them only viable for using the energy row if they're in your hand. If you want the perfect example of just how poorly executed flip cards have been so far, let's compare the cards Punish and Chaotic Darkness. Both cards have the exact same effect, choose a player to discard a card. The difference is that I can play Chaotic Darkness at any time rather than just when I'm taking damage, and it costs half as much. And seeing as Punish is useless in my hand if I draw it, why would I ever want to put it in my deck? So far in deck discussions, Pact of Darkness has been literally the only flip card anybody has considered using, but only because its alternate cost directly synergizes with other cards. Maybe if they change the rules, like they can be played from your hand like action cards, but if they hit your discard pile due to damage, they can be cast for free or at least at a lower cost. It would certainly make Punish vs. Chaotic Darkness an interesting deck building choice. I mean, I can see an issue where people overload their decks with flip cards if damage makes them free, but maybe there can be a trigger limit like you see in other games? Who knows? Which leaves us with two more card types, action cards and hero cards. Action cards, which should be the most common card in your deck, are one and done cards you can play at any time that hit the field, perform their effect, and then go away. They usually mess with the battle in some way, like affecting B power or damage, while others have more specialized effects such as drawing cards, adding cards to the energy zone, disrupting, or even destroying cards your opponent has played. Each attribute also has a unique keyword that can appear on cards, generating an advantage depending on what the keyword is asking for. And then we have hero cards. Hero cards work like action cards, but they instead stay in play and give their effects continuously. They are very powerful cards and can be among the most expensive, but also essential to victory. Funny thing about hero cards is that even though they are supposed to represent individual people, there is no unique rule, meaning you can have several copies of the same hero in play at a time. Steven and the Stevens, we're gonna make you smile. Me, myself, and I, and him, That's me. are all the same guy. So now that we have a gist of how the game goes, what are the strengths and weaknesses of each attribute? Well, let's take a look at them using this handy diagram over here. Pyrus over here is all about aggressive damage and burnout, along with some energy destruction and cards that benefit from being the last card in your hand. Ventus is about getting more cards into your energy zone, helping you shift some big, scary monsters into play faster and draining the strength from your opponents. Chaos up here is more defensive, specializing in boosted B power, controlling more cores than your opponent, and benefiting from community. Aquos is sort of a control element, maybe not the best at fighting, but full of tricks to slow your opponent down and trip up their strategies while drawing lots of cards. And finally, Darkus, which is about subterfuge, discarding cards, and paying a cost in exchange for huge power. So that's the basic gist of the attributes, and uh, actually now that I think about it, have I seen this diagram somewhere before? Oh! Oh, oh that's why they got rid of Subterra. Game designers just can't seem to avoid trying to be like the big one, it seems. Yeah, the basis for each of the five attributes does draw some clear inspirations from the colors of Magic the Gathering, the most popular card game in the world. Some have said that Bakugan dropped the Subterra attribute because of low sales, but I think this might be the real culprit, or at least a contributing factor. Instead, Subterra has been folded into Wind Juventus, which is now the nature attribute. I would joke about how that didn't go so well for the last guys who tried to reboot a popular franchise by changing the Wind character into the Nature character, but honestly, Lewa is like the best part of the Bionicle reboot, so I can't. Not to say that Bakugan is nothing but a magic clone. While it does copy the color structure of magic, as well as the use of a resource row, the rest of Bakugan's rules differ significantly. The method for creating mixed attribute decks is very different. Auralis behaves nothing like magic's equivalent artifact attribute, and oh yeah, you roll marbles onto little cards in order to win. 
Just to clarify, I actually don't really have that big a problem with a card game copying some functions and mechanics from other card games. It's what I refer to as the Eastern philosophy of game design, where while it is important for you to make sure that your game has something that makes it strongly stand out, it's okay to crib a few notes from some other popular games, like standard card size. Really glad they went with that this time around. The core set has nearly 400 cards to it, including a ton of those flip cards where one attribute targets just one other attribute to stop. Honestly, these might have been better off as universal cards since they all do the same thing, but whatever. Well, at least about a hundred of them are the basic character cards which only come with the actual toys, so the base set is a bit more manageable. Now, when it comes to actually getting the cards, there is a pretty decent initial offering from Spin Master, although considering that in the original game, the only way to get more cards was by buying the actual physical toys, pretty much anything is an improvement. Cards are sold in 10 card booster packs for the industry standard $4 a piece and contain six common cards, two text raised rare cards, this game's equivalent to uncommon cards in other games, and one red foil stamped super rare card, this game's rare equivalent. The super rare card can be replaced with higher rarities, the hollow foil awesome rare and gold printed Bakugan Elite cards. Each pack also comes with a parallel foil hex card, which can be any rarity decoupled from the rest of the pack, which, like Pokemon, makes it possible to get more than one super rare at a time. Always a plus. These boosters also come in three packs, which for an extra dollar also nets you an oversized character card of debatable legality and matching back cores of absolute legality. Oh, and a rule book. Which is nice, because the only other place to get a rule book is in the starter packs. And the starter packs are $30. Ugh, yeah, this was one of my big problems with the aforementioned Redakai, where the minimum required starter set in that game was $35 for what amounted to a malformed card tin that couldn't store anything but the plastic tat that came inside it. Here, I think it's a little easier to explain. The intention of these starter packs is that they are basically a $20 Bakugan 3 pack combined with a $10 starter deck, so I can at least make sense of why the starter deck costs this much, but I still think they would benefit from a lower price of entry or a better quality deck that contains at least more than three super rare cards, or at least this box seemingly built to last being usable as card storage. I mean, even the crummy Yokai Watch game got that part right. There also seem to be some minor quality control issues with the cards, with a lot of them coming out already sort of beaten up along the edges and the occasional misprint. The packs do still have a nice nostalgic feel though, with a side pull tab that reminds me of the old Naruto card packs. It's also nice that you can build your team based on the characters you buy. No basic Bakugan cards cluttering packs, nor binging on packs to hunt said starting characters down, just the normal hunt caused by the toys. Oh boy. And how do the main characters from the TV show The Awesome Ones fare in card form? Well, Winton is pretty good, Dan is outright broken and likely to eat a ban, and Leah? Leah is actually really bad. Her effect is really strong if you can get it to go off, but it comes not only with a difficult price tag of four additional heroes, but Leah herself has an energy cost of 10. She's technically a fusion of two characters, so I guess it makes sense that she costs as much as two characters, but it prevents her from being usable. Quick note on the practicality of energy costs. Returning to Magic the Gathering again, the rough gist is that a card that costs six is the limit for what you want to put into your deck, a card that costs seven had better be really dang good, and a card with a cost of eight or more requires assistance to get into play. And Magic is a much slower game than Bakugan. Diamond Maxator may have a mind-boggling damage score of 15, but that 10 energy cost means it won't be seeing any real play without some heavy support. Funny thing, there isn't really any sort of good support for hero or evo cards in this game yet, let alone getting the more expensive ones into play outside of rolling the dice with Dan, who again is totally broken. Add in the life decking that makes it impossible to build a strategy around these cards as they will likely get milled before you're ready to play them, meaning that a whole host of cards are basically unusable. I mean, it could be fixed in a later set with some cost-effective support that can at least move those cards safely into your hand. I mean, there is a card that lets you pull a hero card from your deck to your hand, but the problem is that that card is Leah Venegas. It could just be that the meta hasn't properly congealed yet, but it seems like some entire segments of the game have already been sidelined by the community, including flip cards and cards with energy costs higher than six. And I guess this is a minor nitpick, but do you really have to use the same picture for all of the different attributes of a Bakugan? Add to that, the only way to tell what an Evo card evolves from is just a little snapshot from the basic card without any text. What would happen if we got variant art for these cards? 
And that seems to be another little problem, the occasional lack of clarity. For example, what does this mean? I play this card and I get a knife with a towel wrapped around it? Oh yeah, I'll definitely win with this. I mean, I know what it means now, you don't have to tell me, and I get why they used an icon rather than a keyword since this icon can also be on the reverse side of a Baku core, but this is the first time we are seeing this icon, so it should probably be clarified. Like this, bam, Shadow Strike. How about Hyper Dragonoid here? Bam, evolves from any Aurelis Dragonoid. I did it, I fixed the game, you guys. Sin number seven, by the way. This isn't just a strike against Bakugan though. Cards with unclear mechanics or abilities with no reminder text to clarify them are alarmingly common in a lot of new games. I mean, Magic always uses reminder text on all of their new keywords, even when it's just a new name for a familiar ability. And even though supporter cards have been a thing in the Pokemon card game for over 15 years, every single one still has their special rule printed right on them. These are the two biggest trading card games in the world. They know what they're doing. Although to their credit, Bakugan does at least go halfway with this, with certain cards always mentioning what triggers their keywords like domination, the same way Magic describes abilities like Inspire. That's the way to do it, but I'd like to see it taken all the way. This is the very first set, so it is automatically the first time that we are seeing any of these mechanics, so clarify them on the card, please. Ugh, I'm sorry about that, you guys. It's just, I see this sort of thing happen way too much. But all that said, I still feel the Bakugan game is really well made. While I am not a fan of life decking, I do love games that let you use any card as a resource, as it allows you to add some more situational cards to your deck that become a shoe in for the resource row when it's clear it won't be used. I love how the game lets you mess with your opponent's pieces. Like with Battle Claw, the cores you contribute to the Hide Matrix are up for grabs for either player, letting you mess with your opponent's strategy by trick shotting into their cores, or even aggressively launching straight at their Bakugan to try to knock them away. Oh, and by the way, if you're worried about losing your cores, a little dab of dry erase marker on the hidden side can mark what is yours and easily be wiped off later. But especially, I love the difficult decisions that go into deck building. Unlike most games that give you a bunch of different colors and expect you to pick one and see what you can add, Bakugan instead provides you with five attributes and asks you which ones you will give up on. And that is a fascinating dilemma. The concept of Aurelis simply would not work if not for this inverted deck building priority. I honestly think that as far as design choices go, the good vastly outweighs the bad, and aside from the life decking, the problematic aspects such as Diamond Bakugan and Flip cards can be largely ignored until either the rules are changed or later sets give us better options. The game is going to need some polish and workshopping, but to be fair, so did the original Bakugan. In fact, most games don't really come out fully formed, and it took a particular set or block for even the biggest games to really pull themselves together. I mean, they did finally add rules for priority. That is, which player has the burden of acting first in a given situation to prevent stare downs in a game where people take turns simultaneously and would rather wait for their opponent to move first and counter accordingly. The rules of priority work like this. Whoever placed the last core during setup on the first turn, and after that, whoever won the last fight on each subsequent turn, has priority and must play any cards or choose their Bakugan before the other player. That's a pretty big change from the original rules, and it's nice to see the dev team responding like this. As long as the designers remain receptive to the feedback that the community is giving and do some fixes in the next set, then I think we have a shot at a really good game here, life decking and all. But yeah, it's good. Perhaps its nature is currently misunderstood by either its designers or its audience, though I need to see a deck by the game's designers that makes clever and reliable use of the cards the players have sidelined to convince me it isn't the former, but there is more than enough wheat left after getting rid of the chaff to make for a good time. I mean, there is a bit of a steep initial investment, but it doesn't feel like a waste the way Redekai's high price did. After all, you're also getting the starting pieces, and the ratios of getting the rarest cards in the booster pack seems pretty good, especially with the way hex cards can sometimes double the number of rares in each pack. It means that even my humble collection has a lot of the cards at higher rarities. This, in my opinion, completely makes up for the lackluster starter decks. So those are my thoughts on the card game. It's fun, but still needs a lot of work. Anyway, join me next time in the next episode where we take a look at the final piece of the new Bakugan Battle Planet franchise, The Cartoon Show. Until next time, this is Kodak signing off. Oh yeah, I'll definitely win with this.